Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our last keynote for the Cell and Developmental Biology virtual meeting. I want to also thank our last keynote speaker, Claire Brown, for uh, joining us today and giving, um, and giving her presentation. Claire has worked in the field of quantitative bioimaging for over 25 years. Her research has focused on applying biophysical techniques to fluorescent microscopy images to extract quantitative data measuring protein distributions, dynamics, and interaction, interactions. She applies these techniques to study the regulation of cell adhesion and migration to understand how migration is regulated at the molecular level in normal and diseased cellular systems. Her work has also focused on optimizing live cell imaging to minimize phototoxicity and ensure the collection of high fidelity data that is free of light induced artifacts. She's been the director of the Advanced Bioimaging Facility, ABIF, for, four, for 15 years, excuse me, and developing and implementing active learning courses and workshops in fundamental and advanced light microscopy. And last but not least, Claire takes part in several other groups and organizations with the aim of furthering the use of microscopy in the life sciences. And she'll talk a little bit about that at the end um, after the Q&A. So I also want to remind everyone that we will be taking questions through the talk and during the talk. So go ahead and enter those into the um, Q&A box for us so that we can um, go ahead and get those lined up for Claire at the end of uh, her presentation. So thank you again, Claire, for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, everybody. So it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, tell you a bit about our project on Lipoma Preferred Partner, or LPP, and how it regulates breast cancer, cell migration, and invasion. So breast cancer accounts for approximately 25% of all new cases of cancer, and that accounts for 13% of cancer deaths in Canadian women. One in eight women are expected to develop breast cancer during their lifetime, and one in 33 will die as a result of the disease. In general, people don't die from the breast cancer directly from the primary tumor, but they die from the metastatic cancer. So breast cancer in particular tends to metastasize to the brain, the lungs, the liver, and the bone. And this process has a number of different steps, um, starting from the primary tumor where the cells um, invade the basement membrane, travel through the tissue, intervasate into the bloodstream, or they can travel throughout the body. They can then extravasate out of the bloodstream and migrate to different regions of different organs and metastasize. Historically, uh, cancer treatments have aimed to kill the cancer cells, but if we can inhibit cell migration and invasion, then we have viable targets for cancer treatments and potentially new therapeutics. So we really want to, to find ways to inhibit um, metastases. And in order to do this, we need to understand the molecular mechanisms at play in regulating these different steps. So I'm going to tell you today about two uh, different um, structures and, and how the LPP protein um, is playing a role in regulating them. So the first structure is the uh, focal adhesion, which is a structure which links the cell to its extracellular matrix through uh, contacts between the cytoskeleton and uh, integrin receptors that, that bind to the ECM or the extracellular matrix. And I'm also going to talk about invadipodia, which are um, structures which invade um, perpendicular to the cell down into the extracellular matrix and degrade the tissue and push through so that the cells can invade different tissues. So Lipoma Preferred Partner, or LPP, um, is a protein um, that we've been interested in studying. It's 80 kilodaltons and belongs to the Vixen family. It's involved in spatial control of actin assembly and mechanical transduction. And it interacts with a number of uh, different proteins at both cell-cell contacts and focal adhesions or cell matrix contacts. It has a proline-rich region with an L-factinin binding domain that um, I'll tell you more about after. It localizes two adhesions in response to TGF-beta growth factor treatment, 
And this localization is dependent on one of the limb domains, limb one. So the reason we've been interested in LPP is that it's been linked to metastatic cancer. And this is work done by my uh, collaborative lab, uh, Peter Siegel at the Goodman Cancer Center at McGill. And what they've been able to show is if they inject breast cancer cells into the fat pad of mice, they grow memory tumors. And these tumors uh, grow over time. And this tumor growth is not impacted by LPP. So if the cells are injected with an LPP knockdown, the tumor growth is unchanged. However, importantly, the metastatic burden of the animal is changed. So in uh, normal conditions with LPP present, the tumor cells metastasize to the lung, and you can see from these histological stains a huge tumor burden in the lung of the animal. However, when LPP is knocked down, that tumor burden is much reduced, and you see very few lesions in the lung. In addition, if you look in the bloodstream at circulating tumor cells, they're quite prevalent in control situations where LPP is expressed, but when LPP is knocked down, you don't see very many circulating tumor cells. So LPP is not affecting tumor growth, but it's implicated in the um, ability of the cells to get into the bloodstream and also to get into um, organs at sites of metastases. So we were interested in understanding at the cellular level how LPP might be regulating this process. So we looked at um, LPP's role in cell migration. So these are individual cells which are plated on uh, fibronectin-coated dishes. And we track them over time using bright field imaging, and then we calculate cell tracks for each cell. In the blue here, you see uh, tracking of cells uh, under normal conditions, and in the red is the cell movement after growth factor treatment. And you can see that the cells move faster and further following the growth factor treatment. Under conditions where the LPP protein has been knocked down, even with growth factor treatment, the cells cannot increase in their cell speed. So this dependence on uh, LPP for TGF-beta-induced migration is there. In addition, um, you can see here the blot showing the LPP knockdown. And you can see um, that we have this enhanced cell migration dependent on the TGF-beta treatment. The um, LPP is also um, a time-dependent process. So you can see that we have this uh, time uh, lapse data shown here. And as we treat with TGF data, you can see a gradual increase in the cell migration speed and we reach a plateau around 15 to 18 hours uh, after treatment. Whereas again, in the knockdown cells, we don't see any increase in cell migration over time. So we were interested in looking uh, in more detail at the molecular level what's going on in the cell. So we were interested in, in looking at cell adhesion. And this is a movie showing uh, cells expressing a Paxilin GFP protein. So Paxilin is an adapter protein that's known to localize to the adhesion. And you can see that these structures are very dynamic. They're assembling and disassembling. There's different sizes, different shapes. They're present all across the cell. And there's very tight regulation, both in time and space across the cell. And how are these uh, structures playing a role in regulating cell movement? So if we look um, at the cell, when, when cells migrate, they basically have to assemble adhesions and attach to the extracellular matrix at the front. This usually happens through uh, nascent focal adhesions that are very dynamic. Um, and can develop into intermediate focal adhesions that are a little bit larger and more uh, well-developed. And these uh, create an attachment to the surface and force can be generated to pull the cell forward. At that time, the, cell, the adhesions at the rear of the cell need to disassemble in order to release the attachment and allow the whole cell to process forward. So we're interested in, in understanding these different structures and their uh, dynamics. So there's also three-dimensional organization. So this is a cartoon of an individual one of these structures. So if we look, um, it would be one of these single structures in the cell and the molecular organization there. 
So we have um, the integrin, which is linking the extracellular matrix to the cytoplasmic side of the cell. These are transmembrane proteins. We have an integrin signaling layer. This is where Paxilin and a number of other proteins are kinases, phosphatases, things that are um, regulated and controlling downstream signaling in the cell. There's a force transduction layer, which consists of a lot of structural proteins, such as vinculin and talin, that are linking the adhesion to the actin cytoskeleton. And then there's an actin regulatory layer, uh, which contains proteins such as zixin, and we believe LPP would be in this layer since it's in the zixin family. And just to mention that we're only showing nine of the over 200 proteins that have been implicated in adhesions in this diagram. So these are highly complex and organized structures um, that we need to further understand. So the uh, goal is to identify and track the adhesions at the leading edge. So this is a, these are areas that are protruding and you can see these dynamic adhesions. This is a, a zoom in of this area here. And we used a, a Maris surfaces feature in order to identify these adhesions, track them over time, and measure their intensities. And from those intensities, we can then measure the dynamics of the adhesions and understand if those dynamics are playing a role in regulating cell migration. So to quantify the adhesion dynamics, we ex export the intensity data to Excel. We have MATLAB code um, that was custom designed in the lab by Alex Kipas, who was the lead on this project. And we're able to identify disassembly, stability, and assembly events um, as the adhesions grow and disassemble and change over time. And from these different events, we can look at a semi-log plot of the data and calculate the rate of disassembly and the rate of assembly uh, from those plots. So this data shows um, LPP. Each spot is um, a rate uh, for a single event. So it could be an adhesion may assemble and disassemble, so that would be two spots on the curve, an adhesion may assemble and stabilize and then further assemble, that would be two assembly events. So each dot here is an individual event. And if we look at just um, control conditions, we can measure the assembly and disassembly and you see this large distribution of rates. These measurements were done with Paxilin um, as the readout of the adhesion. So it's not looking at LPP directly, but at Paxilin as a readout of the adhesion. So when the cells are treated with TGF-beta, what we see is an increase in both the rate of assembly and the rate of disassembly. So in general, the adhesions are much more dynamic. If we look at cells where LTP has been knocked down, then they can't respond to the TGF-beta. So similar to cell migration, the uh, dynamics of the adhesion is not increased. If we take those knockdown cells and rescue them with GFP, LPP wild type, then we can actually regain the phenotype and the cells can respond again to TGF data. So we know that um, LPP is playing a role in regulating the adhesion dynamics. We want to explore the protein in more detail. So we have a mutant um, LPP MLIM1, which is mutated in the LIM1 domain so that it can't localize to focal adhesion. And we have a second mutant, uh, Delta ABD, that has a mutation in the alpha actin and binding domain so that LPP can't link the adhesion to the cytoskeleton. So when we go back to the cell migration experiments, you can see here um, when we rescue the cells with LPP wild type, we see that the, from the red curve here, that after growth factor treatment, the cells speed up. And you can see the time course again here at the bottom. However, if we try to rescue with the MLIM1, which can't localize to adhesions, we don't see a response to the growth factor. And similarly, if the LPP can't bind to the actin cytoskeleton, we don't see a response to the growth factor. Similarly, if we look at the adhesion dynamic experiments, we see again, if we rescue the knockdown cells with LPP wild type, we see that response where the adhesions are more highly dynamic. Whereas when we have the inability to localize to the adhesion or the inability to bind to actin or alpha actin and um, to actin, then we are unable to see a response to the growth factor. So this really points to LPP localization to the adhesion and LPP interaction with the actin cytoskeleton 
in order to regulate the dynamics of the adhesion and regulate cell migration. But we were also interested in the mechanical properties of the adhesion. So we used this um, FRET biosensor for tension. So the way this sensor is designed is we have an m fluorescent protein conjugated to a venous fluorescent protein, and there's an elastic linker between them. When the protein is not under tension, the elastic linker is relaxed, and the teal fluorescent protein can transfer energy to the venous uh, in the form of FRET, or fluorescence resonance energy transfer. When the protein is under tension, the elastic linker is expanded, the teal and the venous move further apart, and the efficiency of FRET is lower. This uh, linker is on a vinculin, uh, is conjugated to vinculin, the vinculin head domain, which binds to the adhesion, and the vinculin tail domain, which binds to actin. So we can measure tension across individual adhesions. The experiment here shows the breast cancer cells uh, expressing this sensor. So we have the teal signal and the fret signal. And based on those two signals, we can calculate a fret map or a tension map. And what we find is when we treat with uh, TGF beta, the adhesions have much higher tension, so the lower fret and higher tension. So the red here corresponds to high tension, low fret, and the blue to low tension or high fret. So treatment with growth factor causes an increase in tension, but is this dependent on LPP? So we have our control knockdown cells, and then we have control knockdown cells treated with TGF beta. We see a decrease in the FRET ratio, which means an increase in tension, as I just uh, showed you with the TGF beta above. But then if we have the LPP knockdown, we don't see this change, and we don't see uh, a response and a change in tension in the adhesions after growth factor treatment. These bars are an average of the tension per adhesion. If we look at the average over each cell, we see the same phenotype, that we see a decrease in the FRET ratio or an increase in tension in the control cells, but when LPP is knocked down, we don't see that change in tension. These experiments uh, were done by an undergraduate uh, in the lab working with Alex Kipas, uh, Alex Nowakowski. So if we look at images corresponding uh, to that data I just showed you, you can see in the control cells, uh, the LPP knockdown cells, and the LPP knockdown cells with TGF beta that we have a lot of blue adhesion. So these are corresponding to low tension or high FRET. Whereas in the TGF beta treated cells in the presence of LPP, you can see a lot more adhesions that have red or green, yellow, uh, moderate to high tension. So we're seeing those cells are able to respond to um, the growth factor, whereas the LPP knockdown cells do not. So can that phenotype be rescued um, with the delta ABD LPP? So again, we can see with the wild type cells, if we have the knockdown cells and we put in uh, EGFP wild type, similar to the endogenous, we see a decrease in the FRET ratio or an increase in tension. Whereas when we try to rescue with the delta ABD LPP, so the LPP that can't bind to the actin cytoskeleton, you can see that we don't see uh, response, and we actually see a slight uh, increase in the FRET ratio or decrease in tension, uh, which does show some statistical significance, although we're, um, we're working on getting some more data for that condition. So basically, the LPP has to be able to bind to the actin cytoskeleton in order for the adhesions to uh, respond to the growth factor and have more tension. So another factor that, that plays a role in the progression of cancer is the uh, different tissues with different biomechanical properties. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, women do not die from breast cancer, it's, they die from the metastatic cancer. And you can see from these numbers here that um, at the time of death, there's quite a high rate of cancer metastasis in the bone, the liver, the lung, and the brain. These tissues have very different biomechanical properties. So bone is very hard and stiff, whereas brain is quite soft at about one kilopascal um, of, uh, or sorry, one pascal, uh, one kilopascal of, of um, stiffness. And do these different stiffnesses affect the ability of the breast cancer to metastasize in those tissues? 
So it is known from uh, fibroblast mathematical models and uh, experiments that fibroblasts have a certain stiffness where they move optimally with the, the maximal speed. And if the surfaces are soft or hard, the cells do not move um, as efficiently. So we developed an assay with the uh, Alan Ehrlicher lab uh, in bioengineering at McGill um, using a PDMS substrate. So these are a polymer gel and it can be very highly manipulated in order to get very uh, defined stiffnesses of, of surface. And then the cells are plated on those surfaces and the cell migration was measured. So if you look at the green curve here, you can see that when we uh, put LPP wild type in the knockdown cells, so LPP GFP, we see something very similar to the fibroblast where the cells move optimally on about 40 kilopascal surfaces. And on soft and hard surfaces, they move much more slowly. We also found that when we treat with growth factor, this, the cells can respond and move faster. And this was independent of the stiffness. So we still see the general trend with CGF beta, but the cells in general move faster on all surfaces. However, if the LPP is knocked down, the cells no longer sense the stiffness of the surface, and they move at the same speed on all of the surfaces. So taken together, all of this data really suggests that LPP is acting as a mechanosensor. It's required for TGF beta induced increases in cell migration and adhesion dynamics. It's required for the formation of high tension adhesions in response to growth factor. It needs to be localized to the adhesion and bind to the actin cytoskeleton for these functions. And if we use the delta, uh, LPP delta ABD mutant, which can't bind to the actin cytoskeleton, the cells are unable to respond to the growth factor. And LPP is required to sense and respond to substrates with different mechanical properties. So we're also interested in these in, in beta podia. So, so far I've talked to you about cell movement and cell migration, but the cells have to invade surrounding tissues in order to leave the breast tissue and they need to invade tissues at sites of metastasis. So the primary structure um, known to play a role in this process is the invadipodia. And this structure pushes down into the tissue. Matrix metalloproteases can digest the tissue. And then the actin cytoskeleton plays a role in creating a force in order to push through the tissue and allow the cell to invade. So the question was, is LPP involved in this process? So for this part of the project, a recent uh, master's student graduate from the lab, Elena Vurand, who was uh, um, in my lab as well as Dr. Siegel's lab, uh, developed this assay using gelatin. So basically what you do is you put down a fluorescent gelatin layer on a microscope cover glass. And you have a fluorophore on that gelatin, so you have a nice uniform layer. And when you put the cells down on that surface, if they undergo invasion, then they digest and push out of the way and, and break down the gelatin so that you get dark areas on a bright background. And this, uh, these surfaces can be characterized. Uh, again, we use the surface feature in Amaris in order to do that. So you can see here the actin staining. So this is actin fluidin staining, LPP and focal adhesion. And then you can see the invasion um, spots from this, these uh, two cells. So again, uh, we looked at the impact of TGF beta on invasion. So in the control cells, we do see some uh, invasive spots. But when we treat with TGF beta, the cells are significantly more invasive. If we quantify that, um, you can see that the uh, Cells without growth factor treatment are much less invasive than following growth factor treatment. And this was a, a challenging assay and challenging to quantify as well. So we settled on looking at the total surface area degraded per field of view. So we tried to um, find areas that have similar numbers of cells and look at the um, percentage of the area of the field of view that was dark. So is LPP important for this? So this is showing another example of um, cells expressing LPP where we have minus and plus TGF beta. And again, you can see that increase in invasiveness with the growth factor. And you can also see that here in the quantification. 
However, if we put in the LTP knockdown cells, the cells are unable to respond to the growth factor and the invasiveness does not increase. So it looks like that um, invasion and degradation of the gelatin uh, in response to growth factor is dependent on the presence of LPP. So you're interested in, in combining the invasion assay with the biomechanics or substrate stiffness. So in this experiment, we have the glass cover slip. We put the PDMS layer, similar to the cell migration experiment, and then we add gelatin on top. So we have the three layers, and we can look at the degradation of the gelatin on surfaces of different stiffness. So here you can see the gelatin stain, the actin staining, and then the overlay. And what we found is that on very hard surfaces, there's a lot of invasion. On moderately stiff surfaces, not so much. And on soft surfaces, somewhere in the intermediate. Again, we quantified that over a number of different experiments with 154 fields of view. And we saw something uh, almost the reverse of what we saw with migration, that the invasion was very high on stiff surfaces and very high on soft surfaces but in the intermediate surfaces, the invasion was much lower. So if we combine those two pieces of data, then what we find is that cell migration is maximized on moderately stiff or intermediate stiffness, around 40 kilopascal, whereas invasion is higher on soft surfaces and hard surfaces. So it's very um, possible that LPP is playing a role in regulating that when the surface is an intermediate um, stiffness, the cells are going to move, but if it's soft or hard, um, they're going to focus on invading the tissue. So I'm just going to give you one last uh, experiment that was really quite interesting, and it's, it's preliminary, but uh, I thought it was quite interesting and wanted to uh, present it here today. So we looked at biophysical conditioning of the cells, and this was done uh, with the, the Siegel lab. So what they did is they inject uh, breast cancer cells into the brain of mice, and leave them for three weeks. And then following the three weeks, the cells are isolated, and they're either put directly on surfaces to look at invasion, so this is called ex vivo, or they're taken for one week and conditioned on a plastic surface, so a relatively hard plastic surface, and we have uh, what we call ex vivo plastic. At the same time, we have another set of the same cells that were not put into the mouse that are left in tissue culture on plastic for the entire duration um, and then imaged uh, in the same assay. So the assay is as I've just uh, shown uh, a few slides ago, where we have a PDMS surface of different stiffness on a glass cover slip, and then we have the gelatin layer uh, on which the cells are plated. So this figure is fairly busy, but um, I'll walk you through it, and I think you'll get the, the general idea. So when we take the ex vivo cells, the um, cells are not very invasive at all. So these cells have come out of very soft brain tissue. The brain tissue is around one kilopascal, and the cells are not very invasive at all. When we do put them on a glass surface with, um, with the PDMS, without PDMS, sorry, just directly on the glass, we put the gelatin, then we, uh, we do see quite a bit of invasiveness. However, if the cells are put on, on the plastic tissues for a week and reconditioned on this hard surface, then they tend to be invasive on all surfaces of all stiffness. Similarly, the cells that were on the plastic dish that were never put into the mouse are highly invasive on all surfaces. So this data was quantified, and I'll just mention again, this is preliminary data, so it's a single experimental run. And uh, I just want to point out that the scaling here is quite different on the three graphs, uh, just for your information. So the ex vivo cells really don't invade much at all. The, the total surface area degraded is only going up to 3,000 here. Um, although they do form um, invaded podia on the glass surface, this uh, is around uh, an average of about 800 um, surface area. The ex vivo plastic you can see is, is going up to 1,500, so this is significantly higher. And you can see a very similar trend to what um, I showed you with the um, other cell line that the um, cells tend to invade maximally on soft and hard surfaces and are a little bit less invasive on moderate stiffness. If you look at the cells that stayed on the hard plastic surface for the entire duration, you can see the scale here is, is 50,000. So these are much more invasive than the other two uh, conditions. 
and we can see that the, the levels are quite high across the, um, the different stiffnesses. We don't see the same clear trend that we see here with the ex uh, vivo plastic, but we're working on uh, doing the uh, experiment a few more times to, to validate that. So overall, um, this shows that cells can be conditioned. So by moving to different environments, they adapt to the environment they're in. And by being on a hard surface, they tend to uh, be able to adapt uh, in order to invade surfaces of all different biomechanical properties. So I just want to wrap up with uh, uh, another short story, um, which is not related to breast cancer, but I think is um, very important for all live cell imaging. And you'll notice in the whole breast cancer project, we did a lot of, uh, of live imaging under all the different conditions. And um, we've been working on live imaging and phototoxicity in my lab for quite a long time, and recently discovered uh, an issue that um, we were aware of, but not really aware of the magnitude of the problem. So this work was recently published in the Journal of Cell Science, and you can read all the details there. I just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot because I think this problem is probably quite um, ubiquitous, and I think most people are not aware of it. So I think it's important. So when we do fluorescence imaging, and including the experiments that I've shown you um, here on uh, focal adhesions and gelatin degradation and so on, um, there's a process we have to go through. So we need to open the shutter to expose the sample to light. We need to turn on the light source, um, expose the sample to light, and collect an image. And then we have to turn off the light source and or close the shutter, save the image, and then repeat the process. So as we do the time-lapse imaging, we, we go around this circuit multiple times. So the key steps are, are opening the shutter, turning on the light source, and then closing the shutter and turning off the light source. And all shuttering is not the same. So you can have a mechanical shutter. If you have like a mercury, a xenon, or a metal halide source, the source stays on all the time, and you have a mechanical shutter that opens and closes to expose your sample to light for fluorescence imaging. Or you can have electronic control. So with LED light sources, you can have USB control from the image acquisition software, or you can have direct TTL electronic triggering from the camera. And as I mentioned, it's really important to know that all shuttering is not the same. So the reason this problem came to our attention is we were working on some experiments to systematically look at how the um, incident light power of the lamp and the exposure time were um, playing a role in phototoxicity, if at all. And what we found is when we use high incident light power and short exposure time, so 24 milliseconds here, the cells were not very dynamic at all. So these rose plots are showing fairly short um, cell tracks. However, when we used the long exposure time with low light power, we did find that the cells moved quite significantly, and these matched up really well with our bright field imaging, where we wouldn't expect any phototoxicity. So initially, we thought that the reason um, the, the cells were not moving well at high power was just because of the power of the light. So the cells were seeing a lot of photons in a short amount of time. But we found out after that that was not the case. So we used an oscilloscope um, to actually measure the shuttering of our light source. And we had three different settings that we looked at. So in all cases, the software was set for a 24 millisecond camera exposure. And in the first case, the light was turned on and off using a TTL trigger. So this is a, a cable which basically goes directly from the camera to the light source and sends a signal from the camera saying, I'm ready to collect light and collect an image. And in this case, we had no what we call illumination overhead. The shutter really opened and closed, uh, or the lamp turned on and off in 24 milliseconds. However, in the experiment I just showed you, we had been using the USB connection because that gives us the ability to control the light source using the image acquisition software. And what we found there is this red curve. And when we were actually doing a 24 millisecond image acquisition, the light was actually on for 137 milliseconds, or almost six times the exposure time. If you're using a mechanical shutter, this is a physical shutter that needs to open and close. And in that case, we found it took about 230 milliseconds, um, or 10 times the exposure time. So these delays are termed uh, illumination overhead, where the sample is exposed to light, but the, um, 
the detector is not collecting an image. And um, these, these delays are linked both to software and hardware. So when the mechanical shutter physically has to open and close, in the USB light, um, we know that the LED can turn on very rapidly, so there must be other um, potential software delays um, playing a role there. So we went back to our cell migration experiment, and this is the data I already showed you, where at high incident light power, the cells don't move very well. And when we were sure that the, the sample was being illuminated with the TTL triggering, so that it was only illuminated for 24 milliseconds for each image, then we did see cell tracks that were very similar to the long exposure time, low light levels. So the effect that we were seeing was actually due to this illumination overhead. In this case, we had the USB signaling um, going, and so there was some kind of software delay that was allowing the light to stay on about six times longer. So this is another example just showing you what can happen in the live cell experiment. So on the left side, we have low power and long exposure time, and we're looking at cells expressing Paxil and GFP, also stained with uh, mitotracker red. And you can see that the cells are very dynamic, and the mitochondria are moving around and fusing and, and diffusing, and everything looks quite good. This is four hours of imaging, taking an image every minute, and taking an image of the mitotracker every six minutes. On the right side, we have the high power short exposure time, and this was collected with the USB signaling, so we know that we have about five times the amount of light on the sample than uh, we expect, or sorry, almost six times. And you can see here that the mitochondria uh, very early on start to uh, condense and the cell starts to round up and eventually uh, the cell likely dies and disappears from the field of view. You can see the importance of, of this illumination overhead and how it can really drastically affect the phototoxicity. So the best thing to do is trigger your light source directly with the TTL. Um, this is only possible if you have a solid state source, so an LED based light source or a solid state laser. Um, you can also measure the illumination overhead because we found there's all kinds of differences depending on the exposure time you set and the frame rate. Even the delay between images can affect um, the illumination overhead. And for bulb based systems where you have to use a mechanical shutter and you can't do direct triggering, uh, it's best to use the lower power and longer exposure time. Um, that uh, would be similar to this condition so that you can image the cells for a long period of time without the effect of toxicity. So as I mentioned, that's just a bit of a snapshot. And all the details are in the, the publication, but I really think it's important that people are aware of this phenomena and adapt their live cell imaging um, conditions for it. We observed it also in our spinning disk on focal, um, which had a, a software delay as well, even though it had solid state layers. Laser, sorry. So I'd like to thank uh, the members of my lab. I mentioned the people who worked on the project as I was going along, and also the Advanced Bioimaging Facility staff. All of the uh, imaging was done in our facility at McGill. So uh, I mentioned the students in my lab, our collaborators. Uh, Peter Siegel is really the, the lab that initiated the LPP project, and I've been really uh, excited working with them, uh, trying to get at the molecular level and look at live cell imaging. And Alan Ehrlicher's lab um, has worked with us for all of the PDMS and substrate stiffness experiments. And thank you, of course, to all of our funding agencies. Without them, uh, this work wouldn't be possible. And I thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions. Hi, Claire. That was a great talk. Um, I'm so glad that you shared the, the work you guys did looking at the phototoxicity. I think it's such an important story for everyone to hear. And those early results are super tantalizing. Um, so yes, thank you again. Um, I, uh, I do have a, uh, some questions um, from the audience. Good. I do have some questions from um, the audience, so let's get started with those. A lot of the work that you showed uh, was uh, of cells migrating in 2D. Does this have relevance in vivo? 
So um, I know a lot of uh, there's a lot of debate in the field about about the experiments that are done on uh, on flat glass surfaces, but there are a lot of surfaces in the biology, um, including like the basement membrane. Uh, sometimes cells will move along a blood vessel, so that's kind of like a, a rolling or folded two dimensional surface. And uh, even uh, movement along collagen fibers, uh, people have modeled as more of a one-dimensional migration where the cells are moving along almost like a rope or a cable. So I do think it has uh, uh, some role to play in, in uh, the natural environment of the cell. Okay, yeah, I hadn't thought about uh, collagen as a, as a 1D thing, that's cool. Um, uh, sort of along the same lines, do you have plans to explore the role of LPP in regulating cell migration in more physiological uh, environments? So we have um, some data where we've been looking at the cells on top of uh, three-dimensional surfaces. So rather than using the PDMS, which is really a chemical uh, material that we've that you know that has been developed. Uh, we put the cells on top of things like bovine collagen or rat tail collagen that are that are more physiological relevant. And we are working on um, assays now to look at single cells and spheroids in uh, three-dimensional gels. The um, sample prep and so on is actually quite challenging to get reproducibility and, and have the cells moving and, and migrating uh, in a systematic way. And then uh, the microscopy in that case, we're, we're working with both spinning disk and uh, light sheet imaging so we can image fast enough uh, to mm -hmm. see the processes. You mentioned PDMS. Um, how, uh, how hard is it to make all those different, the series of different stiffnesses in the, in the PDMS? Um, so uh, we did that in collaboration with uh, Alan Ehrlicher's group and uh, some really tremendous uh, bioengineers in his lab. Um, it's super tricky, and uh, um, Alana has graduated, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to maintain it in the lab. But it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of chemical steps. Um, some of the steps for cleaning the surface, there's a reagent called piranha. So, of course, you want to make sure you don't have any piranha left by the time you put your cells down. Mm -hmm. um, we had issues with drying out and cracking and then trying to put the gelatin on top, you, you have a, another interface um, where the gelatin can peel off or, or um, you know, wrap over on itself and so on. So, um, so I think we have it down to a pretty good uh, protocol, but I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kudos to the students for persisting because it, uh, the results are fabulous, but the, the troubleshooting is pretty intense. So. Yeah, we wouldn't know it <laughs> from what you've shown. Um, let's see. So another another thing is that there's uh, you're showing a lot of data on individual cells or individual adhesions. Do you have a plan to perform more advanced uh, data analytics, really, um, rather than just looking at averages? So this is a direction um, my lab's really been moving to uh, in the last, uh, I would say, year or so. I have a postdoc now who's a computer scientist who's got a lot of expertise in deep learning and machine learning. And uh, we're starting to apply things like um, unsupervised learning with like hierarchical clustering and bioinformatics that are used more in genomics but are starting to be applied more in imaging. And uh, it's really fascinating. Um, we're seeing like you know, you might have a treatment and 90% of the cells respond, but there's this 10% that don't. Mm -hmm. And now we're interested, like, what's going on with that 10%? And, and I guess eventually, um, it's not really my area of expertise, but you could also imagine doing, like, single-cell RNA-seq and, yeah. and really trying to tease out how come those cells, you know, respond differently. And I um, was at a seminar years ago, and, and uh, it was a really cute story that the speaker told, talked about uh, school buses, and that if you were looking from space and studying school buses on the earth, you would conclude that they aggregate in big groups and they don't move. <laughs> and unless you actually happen to be, you know, at six in the morning or three in the afternoon, mm -hmm. you'd never see that. And so it's always kind of stuck with me that maybe the, the things we're always seeing are not the most interesting. So Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I look forward to hearing more about all of that. 
Um, and I want to make sure that we have a question talking about the, the second half or the second part um, of what you presented today. So um, you were talking about illumination overhead and, the, and this concept of making sure you're thinking about all of uh, the illumination that's going to the sample. And so how big of a problem or how, how broad of a problem do you think this is for everyone? So we were super surprised. I was um, pretty sure that this was due to the light power. And I'd always thought that there's just more photons hitting the cell really quickly. And uh, I didn't, I knew that there was issues with the timing, but I didn't really think it was the only thing going on. Mm -hmm. And it really seems from our data that it's the major effect is, is from this effect. And it's really complicated. We've done more experiments and uh, we find it on spinning disks. So even though our, our laser is triggered um, electronically, it's a solid state laser, we still have this 17 millisecond delay between images that we can't really explain. And so if you're working with high intensity and short exposure times, that 17 milliseconds is really significant. Um, so what our approach now is um, we're actually working on a protocol paper on how to measure it because it took us a long time to figure out um, how to measure it properly. Yeah. And then I think one of the things I'd really like to do is just bring awareness to people um, because I think most people don't know about it. And there are fixes. So once you know it's there, it's a lot easier to fix it. So I think we've been trying to talk to the microscope vendors and um, core facilities and just get the word out um, to just be aware of this if you're doing uh, at live imaging. But that being said, I think it's also important for fixed cells. You can imagine if you're doing high resolution Z stack and trying to do deconvolution, it's photo bleaching as you're going. Uh, but you're really, you know, throwing away all this light, which you don't have to be if you, if you're, um, you know, more in tune with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had another question come in. Um, given what you've learned about the light dosing, are you trying to account for that when imaging through the PDMS and the gelatin um, because they have different optical properties? Um, so it is it is tricky imaging through those. The experiments I showed you with the, the PDMS and the gelatin were actually done on laser scanning confocal because we have to um, have the signal to noise through that thick surface. So they're actually difficult to do on a wide field. Mm -hmm. um, so usually with laser scanning confocal, you don't have to worry about the overhead illumination because um, these are triggered um, instantaneously pretty much with acoustic mm -hmm. optics. But I do think the power density then starts to play a role because you've got the light focused into this little tiny spot with a lot of photons. Mm -hmm. So you do have to play around a bit with scan speed and intensity of the light and, and so on to be sure that you're minimizing phototoxicity on that platform as well. Okay. Okay. I think we'll wrap up with questions, but um, there's one other thing that we wanted to talk about. Claire has mentioned how she's publishing and making sure that other core facilities and that sort of thing know about this overhead problem and you're performing uh, what I see as a really nice service to the community um, and other ways that you are serving the community is taking part in these um, other organizations. And so you, along with Allison North, are co-chairs of the Bioimaging North America um, group. And I think you wanted to talk just a little bit about that and make sure everybody knows about it. Um, so yeah, I'll let you do that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a recent uh, group. We founded it about two years ago. And uh, the idea is to just bring the community together um, to build uh, consensus around different things, to build awareness. Um, the focus of the uh, group right now is working groups. So we have working groups on quality control and standards. Uh, we're in the process of forming a new group on image analysis. Um, we have a diversity and inclusion group, and uh, we also have a communications group. And we're looking to, to form more um, as the, the group grows. And the sort of the um, way that we've been forming those working groups is getting people who are not part of the executive to take a lead. And we've been bringing in a lot of younger uh, researchers who are just starting up core facilities. And, and uh, I think bringing, building, the, building the community and they're bringing along uh, their peers and, and so on. And for instance, with the quality control and standards group, we're working on getting a consensus of how to measure quality control on a confocal. And then we want to present that to the community and try to come up with a, a consensus on, you know, the best way to measure resolution or, mm -hmm. or um, 
laser stability and things like that. So I think it's going to be a tremendous tool for the community. We also plan, uh, we've applied for funding from the NSF and we're hoping um, to get money which will be focused completely on core facility scientists. So um, it'll be for travel to meetings, for job shadowing, when we can get back to traveling. <laughs> and um, and just, uh, again, just building up that expertise and really recognizing the imaging scientists uh, who are working in facilities and, and helping, you know, the whole community of, of labs working in areas like cell and developmental biology. Uh, yes. So, um, so next week we actually have a, an event. Um, three weeks ago we had an event looking at um, personal protective equipment and, and how to open facilities safely and We've published those guidelines that kind of came out of the meeting on the Royal Microscopy Society website. And we're having a follow-up meeting next Wednesday, June 10th, uh, on um, ways to uh, manage users. And um, we're going to have some of the, uh, the companies that are working with uh, core facility management software. I know for me, I have like three or four microscopes in some rooms, so we're going to have to make sure we don't have too many people accessing yeah. the room at the same time. And how do we prioritize people and so on? So, so that's next uh, Wednesday in collaboration with UK Bioimaging and and the Royal Microscopy Society. So, I would encourage people to to join in the conversation, and we're all learning from each other. So, if anybody has any great ideas, we'd love to hear them. It's all new for all of us, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again for taking part in that and really sort of, yeah, uh, providing a, uh, some ni really nice resources to the entire community. And I think everyone does appreciate it and I very much appreciate you taking part in our meeting and presenting this keynote. It was great. Um, and thank you to everyone that has uh, watched us and will watch us. So these will be around for a year. Um, so if you haven't been able to catch a keynote or one of the other um, talks that's out there, they will be within this in virtual environment for a whole year. Um, so you have some time. And yeah, uh, we'll make sure that the other questions that came in from Claire, came in for Claire, that she gets those as well too. So thanks again to everyone. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>